So my quest of troubleshooting on my Unify 7 problems of Wi-Fi, everything. Yeah, this is the U7 Pro, Pro Max. Don't buy those right now if you do the whole smart home thing with 2.4 gigahertz. They suck for that right now. We're still working on some firmware stuff with them. Hopefully that will get fixed soon. But that allowed me to attack my Wi-Fi traffic and look at what my biggest offenders were. I don't run a lot of cameras in 2.4 gigahertz, so that wasn't my big issue there. My biggest issue was the Bluetooth options. So now this is PoE, but all my ESP32 that were Wi-Fi based is it takes all the Bluetooth traffic, everything it can hear, turns around, sends it right back out over Wi-Fi. Well, if you're not sure what is all Bluetooth, there's a crap ton of stuff and some of it's not even yours. It may be phones and cars and everything else passing by and it's taking all those beacon traffics and sending it back over Wi-Fi and sending it back to Home Assistant for the cool Bluetooth proxy stuff. Yeah, if you haven't seen some other stuff on what I can do with Bluetooth proxy, I mean, you've got temperature displays by like SwitchBot, some cool stuff. You got Shelly buttons all Bluetooth, even down to wallet finders by SwitchBot. That one's a pretty cool thing. I wanna do some triangulation with Bermuda, which I'll get to in a little project later. And um, temperature sensors that don't have displays, stuff to put in the freezer, lawn mowers, and even pool lights, pool temperature sensors, all out in the yard and everything. It all happens over Bluetooth proxy and it pops straight into Home Assistant. It's pretty badass if you haven't checked out some of that stuff. But the big problem is you're going to send all that traffic back over Wi-Fi. And yeah, I'm trying to get rid of as much as I can. And no, I'm not going to Z-Wave just yet. So what I would want to do is I'm going to attack and I'm trying to get rid of as much as I can. And I've looked at the Olimex PoE, you know, power over Ethernet. So you got your Ethernet plug here, and then of course the ESP32 can pick up all the Bluetooth stuff, and it basically picks up all, just receives for the most part, and sends it out over Ethernet. But the Olimex would get rather hot, and yeah, you can see right here, look at the temperature difference, 160 Fahrenheit, and then check out the Lilygo was getting a little over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and it also pulls less wattage on the switch. Like, I wanna say this was like two and a half watts, and this was like one watt, so it's just dumping all that heat. And well, I don't know, I had one burn out on me. So I just don't feel comfortable with the Olimex ones anymore. They are pretty nice, you plug in the USB and rock and roll. But I looked for an alternative, the LilyGo is also dual core ESP32, the only side difference to it is you need the first time you install ESP Home, you're gonna have to get the little board, you shove it in the little holes and you throw ESP Home on it. It's pretty damn simple. So that's what we're gonna be doing in this video. There is a 3D printed case to it. I'll leave all the links down below for things. The cost of the Lily Go right now, I think it was like around 25 to $30 US, depending on where you get it but um, it's pretty awesome because of this feature right there, being able to plug it in ethernet and it gets power over the damn ethernet cable to do all the things for your Bluetooth proxy and cut down on all that Wi-Fi traffic on the 2.4 gigahertz. So you can let all your other things happen on the 2.4 gigahertz side. This is the Olimex on this side and this board does have like micro USB on the side. You can just hook that up and flash your firmware to it. But yeah, this thing gets smoking hot right there in this area and the LilyGo does not. Now, you may be tempted to pull off the sticker on the LilyGo. Do not do that. There's actually instructions on their page saying not to do that. Now, to get your firmware on it first with ESP Home, you will need to make sure and buy their little downloader suit or suite board, they call it. Um, this USB-C is just for power using USB-A, but we won't be using that with the power over Ethernet on the side here. Now, you may be thinking, oh, no, no, it's soldering. No, no, it's not soldering. You just literally, what you'll see in a little bit in the video, is when we put ESP Home on this, you just stick it in like that, and that's it. 
and then you plug in USB-C or the micro USB or whatever the old school is. OG calls it the one-way USB. And um, so that's it. You just put it in the hole and let it sit there. And that's it. And then once you put your firmware on it, you don't have to do that again because ESP Home is going to send updates over the wire to it when you change versions. Now, you can solder stuff and do things with the other GPIO pins, but I like to let my Bluetooth proxy just Bluetooth proxy. Now, they do make another one. Lily Go, but this is going to be all soldering. And look at the size of this thing. It's like this stack thing or whatever. This is an S3. And you do have to solder some pins on it and buy the PoE module, but it does also have Ethernet. I'll leave all the links down and all the description and everything. If you want to get your soldering on it, do an S3 version of the PoE proxy. And uh, of course, I'll leave the links for the case. This is a pretty slick case and uh, it just pops right in. Doesn't block all the holes. You can still get access to USB-C and everything on the side. And they even made this cool cover that says ESP Home on the top, if you can see that in the glare. So, uh, yeah, if you don't have a 3D printer, you could just throw this in like a little project box just so nothing shorts out on it. So let's jump into doing the ESP Home YAML flashing on this and get it going. So we're going to flash or install whatever politically correct term you want to put the actual software on the LilyGo PoE device. Now, if you haven't done ESP Home stuff, don't freak out. There's no soldering. There's no things. It's just a bunch of copying and pasting and holding some wires and plugging in a USB and you're done. But yeah, listen to me talk a while too and waffle. So if you haven't done ESP Home, you're probably one of those HAOS users. It's fairly simple to get started. Just need to install the little add-on, go through here. It's on esphome.io. You can add the add-on. If you do Docker Compose, Unraid, everything, it's all right in here. Do Unraid people just go install the little template thing, rock and roll. They have all the stuff right here. It's not hard to do. It's a simple Docker container in a GUI to manage all your stuff. At this time, there's not like a pre-built firmware for this actual device. It's not a bad thing. Actually, I do prefer going building my own firmware. That way you can put your own names and everything right in your own device. You kind of control your own destiny or density or, yeah. So all you gotta do in the GUI itself is hit new device. And don't hit the open ESP home web. I probably do things a little different than some, but I try to keep it simple. Just hit continue. And we're going to start out with our actual name of our device. Now, this is where you got to figure out, like, what's a good naming convention? So mine's probably not the best, so don't follow me. I'm just calling it ESP32 Lily PoE2 BT Proxy. I already have one. I should probably put it in the actual room as the name or something like that. But they're fairly simple to change the names and everything. And this really doesn't matter. But for all you warm and fuzzies, I still wish they had a blank option, ESP Home Devs. But yeah, just pick ESP32. It's going to put it in a stock thing. We're going to overwrite it all. It, I don't use the encryption keys. I feel that this is my private network and the ESP32 is doing enough as it is. So I'm just going to hit skip. It's up to you if you want to use them. Then we're going to go over here and find our new device and hit edit. And you'll see it's already filled out everything. Now, where do you go get the config? Well, I have a bunch of them and different ones on my website. So go over to digiblur.com. If it's not the new one at the top, just hit home assistant and look down in here. You can actually see I have ESP home, Bluetooth proxy, Lily go TPOE, internet ESP 32. Yeah, it's a long ass name for this device. So scroll on down. There's the actual 3D printed file. If you want that, um, see so yeah, it jumps to... I think it's Instructables and pretty cool little case. Here's the YAML file. So really what you can do is you don't need the name and stuff. Cause if you look here, you can see it's got your name already. The one that you gave it. So if you copy mine, well, it's going to overwrite and change the name. So what I like to do on some of these, especially on my here, I just hit the little copy button right here. Because I'm lazy, it just copies the whole thing and it doesn't make sure that, you know, you're not going to screw something up. So then I'll actually copy 
and paste over everything except for my top of my names. I end up with two ESP homes. So let me zoom in here and you can see it's already telling us like, hey, you got something screwed up right here. That's because of the name. Well, I'm going to take out my old name that came from the YAML file. So then you just delete that. The logger, this is commented out, the little hashtag or pound sign, depending on your age. I Very verbose, if you want to play around with and just watch it scan all the Bluetooth proxies, you can. Um, API, OTA, like I said, if you want to keep your keys, you could for that. Now, here's the important part, ESP32 BLE tracker. Now, you'll notice the interval in the window is much different than the Wi-Fi ones. And this can change over time. I will edit the file if they start to change stuff. It also uses ESP IDF, which is another key thing. Um, if you don't really get into nerdy stuff, but actually in the ESP home docs, they recommend it for Bluetooth proxy. So it is an active BLE tracker, Bluetooth proxy active. And then we get a safe mode. And then there's the ethernet stuff, the ethernet chip. It already has the pinouts for you. I've done all that cool stuff for you. That way you ain't got to figure that all out. And I did leave this in here for the ones that want to do this. I prefer to do that for my Ethernet stuff. You don't have to, but it's kind of better for if your IP doesn't change. And then especially if you have MDNS issues on your network and you may like, well, hey, my stuff shows offline, but it's really online or I can't connect to it or whatever. Well, give it a static IP. Now, keep in mind, you do need to put this outside of your DHCP range. So on your router, if it says like DHCP range starts at 100 and goes to like 254, well, then you may want to put this under 100. Give it an IP. It's not going to conflict. It's not like the end of the world because if you screw this up, because just change it and then use the downloader and just plug it back in and put the new firmware, right? So, but do find and, and put a good set of IP addresses and everything on this device. I'm gonna leave mine blank for right now and rock and roll. Now, one other thing I add is totally up to you. If you wanna add them, I use my own domain. I don't use .local. That's a whole different thing on networking. Um, another key tip, if you want to not lock in this IP address, because say if you're doing a lot of statics, you could actually do a secret and just do like exclamation point secret and then use the name Lily POE2 BT proxy. And that way you can keep all of your static IPs and ESP home right in your secrets. That way it's a one-stop shop. So then we'll hit save. There's nothing else you really need to do for the file. Totally up to you. you want to jump around. You can start to add things to it, but my Bluetooth proxies, I really prefer that they just BT proxy. They don't really do a whole lot else. Um, like say for instance, I've seen people put them on all kind of other crazy sensors, like especially MM wave stuff, MM wave sensors talk a crazy amount. So does Bluetooth. You're going to have issues. I promise you eventually, if you don't right then from the jump, these ESP 32s, they're just cheap little few dollar chips. They're not my super, you know, computers and everything. So be gentle to them. It, just don't give yourself the trouble of trying to do a whole lot of one device to save things. Just let this thing BT proxy and do its deal. So I'm going to hit install. This is the important part, but hit manual download. This may take a while depending on your actual device. So if it's like a Raspberry Pi or something like that, it can take just quite a while, especially um, if you have to download all those packages and everything. If you have a pretty quick system, it's just going to compile everything and get it done. What we need is really important is factory format. Don't do OTA. It will download the file. Watch your browser. It may have to hit like the keep thing to actually keep that bin file. It may call it bad or something like that. And what do we do now with the bin file? Well, the next part is we actually need to connect the actual ESP32. Now what I'm doing here is actually this is a USB switch. It actually passes power and data. They're pretty damn awesome. I didn't have one for years and I feel like an idiot for flashing stuff without it. Because you don't have to jostle your cables around. You just hit the switch and you don't screw things up. Remember, we didn't solder this. All I did is I propped as I stretch out and propped it up on that case just to kind of put it at an angle and it puts some tension on those pins. That way they actually do touch the solder points. You don't need to solder this and you probably don't want to, otherwise it won't fit in the case. 
Now, if you do use USB-C, it does not work with a USB-C to C cable on this downloader. A lot of issues of other ESP32 devices, USB-C, you do need to use a USB-A to C cable that does pass data. Now, of course, you can use the older school USB port right next to it as well, as the OG calls it, the one-way USB. So hold up. Nothing ever goes as planned in a video. For some reason, I had to add this blue jumper for the ESP home page. It doesn't have to be used for ESP tool pie. Now you don't need the jumper if you have some really stable hands and you know, since we're not soldering it and the board kind of flexes and disconnects, if you're messing with it, if you hold down the GPIO zero button as you're applying power, it seems to be the ESP home install page will then accept it. Now, if you use ESP tool pie, you don't have to do any of this. So this method I'm talking about at the bottom, ESP tool pie, or you can use the ESP tool that is already pre-compiled for like Mac OS, Windows, et cetera. You don't have to install Python. You don't need to put this jumper on there. So, but I'm using the web installer. It's a little easy. There's no install for people. There's no download. So add the little jumper. It's just a little DuPont jumper going between ground and GPIO zero. Not sure what the bug is with the ESP home install page with this particular device. So we have it done. We're gonna go here and we're gonna hit connect. If you do not see a device listed here, it says like here, and it says, hey, I, I, there's no serial port, no compatible devices, just hit cancel. It's gonna walk you through all this stuff. Now the chip we have is the CH340 that's on that little downloader board. Download the drivers and go ahead and go through and install it or also check your Windows update if you're running Windows, but then you need to probably restart the web page and everything and you shouldn't have to do it again for all the other cool stuff. And I'm gonna hit, hit connect and you should see it up there, hit connect. And then we're gonna hit install. Don't hit prepare for first use. And we need to go get that bin file we just compiled from the actual dashboard. If you don't see it in your downloads, you probably had Chrome block it. Check the downloads and say, yeah, I do want to download and keep that bin file because it's trying to save you from some weird stuff and know it's a good file. Then once you hit install, it should say connecting and then going to erasing and then it'll start to do the install. If you have everything, all the stars align, if you may have to readjust it again, um, but definitely put that jumper on there if you have issues. That's it, you can see it's done. Configuration is installed. You can hit close, you're good to go. Yeah, you can go ahead and disconnect it and go plug it into Power over Ethernet and put it in your case. If you don't have a case, just get one of them little soap boxes or some little project box, cut some holes in, ain't gotta be pretty, and throw it in there. Just, you don't wanna short out your board and throw it up somewhere behind a cat, whatever it may be where you have some Power over Ethernet. And uh, yeah, then you wanna think about putting several of them around the house. If you flip over to Home Assistant, you're probably gonna get a notification that you have a new device. If you don't have it auto-discovered right here, then just hit Add Integration, type ESP Home, and then go put in the IP address and manually add it to the device. If you get an error about it, then maybe you need to do a little network troubleshooting. Um, if you really get stuck on some of this, jump into my Discord, it's just Digiblur. Uh, Discord, or you can search for it, or you can go to just discord.digiblur.com. So I'm just gonna hit configure on this, and it's gonna say, hey, success, and that's pretty much it. Um, I know a lot of people ask, well, hey, what can I tell to see, like, what devices are picking up things? Is it really working? Because there's not a whole lot that shows on actual ESP Home that, like, unless you turn on the logging and everything, well, this is not what that whole video is about, but um, you can actually go see some of that stuff in Bermuda, which is a little HACS installation. And you can actually come into Bermuda and hit configure, and you should see all of your Bluetooth proxies listed here. Um, this one's been dead for a while, I was playing with it. That's the Olimex. And uh, you'll see actually right here, Lily PoE Bluetooth proxy. And you can see I'm scan it shows all the devices and everything, so you know that one is 
working. And then you should be able, if you go play around with Bermuda a little bit, probably do a video on some of this stuff, is you can actually see devices that that actual Bluetooth proxy is picking up. So that's pretty much it about doing your own Bluetooth proxy and getting the damn thing over power over Ethernet and saving your Wi-Fi. And um, yeah, again, don't buy the Unify 7 right now unless um, maybe I pin a comment that it's okay now. Would you buy one? It leads us to that, right? Absolutely. Been buying these things. I've, this is like my third one. And um, I think I've got one other spot I want to do for Ethernet. And that gets me rid of for the most part, except for I think one ESP32 Bluetooth proxy I have in the backyard. It might be somewhat difficult, but I probably can run an Ethernet cable to it when it gets cool enough in the attic. And uh, I can also get rid of that one as well. So um, yeah, it just works. It's Ethernet, it's PoE. Don't have to plug it into the power outlet, chargers and everything. So uh, that about do it for this one. Do appreciate all the Patreon subscribers, YouTube members. We definitely couldn't do it without you and bring projects and products and whatever to the channel all the time. And so y'all know the drill. Press all them buttons down there and y'all take care. Whatever you want. Yeah, huh?